I get called like the self-hating, miserable cretin, but never, you know, a self-hating, miserable cretin who has good brush strokes. You know what I mean? That's what I would like. That's just give me some of that, you know? Even if you're gonna compare me to Hitler, say I'm the reincarnation of Hitler, but I like the lines. Welcome to Amusing Jews, where we celebrate Jewish contributors and contributions to American popular culture. I'm Jonathan Friedman. And I'm Joey Angelfield. Producer engineer Mike Tomrin is working somewhere behind the scenes. Amusing Jews is a project of Adat Chavarin Congregation for Humanistic Judaism, the Jewish Museum of the American West, and Atheist United Studios. Hey, Joey. The best political cartoons combine artistic value, humor, and a direct comment on current events, swaying the reader's opinion towards the cartoonist's point of view. In some cases, the more provocative and stylistically severe the cartoon, the better. Our guest today has achieved the medium's subversive, darkly humorous, and grotesquely enticing potential, creating brutal commentaries that are nearly impossible to unsee. We're thrilled to chat with Ellie Valley, a writer and cartoonist whose work has been featured in The Nation, The New Republic, The Village Voice, Jewish Currents, The Guardian, The Daily Beast, and elsewhere. He is the author of the critically acclaimed book, Diaspora Boy, Comics on Crisis in America and Israel, and the forthcoming book, Museum of Degenerates, Portraits of the American Grotesque. Ellie, welcome to Amusing Jews. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. How did you get started in cartooning and political cartooning in particular? Well, I used to enjoy drawing when I was little, and I, I drew like in high school and college. Um, but I mean, I don't really, you know, it. it it's such a weird thing to think of as like a career. I, I stopped doing it after college for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them was, you know, even though uh, now we're experiencing the the big implosion of uh, print media back then, it was the beginning of it. And uh, it was really hard to find a job. You know, newspapers didn't feel like um, hiring an individual cartoonist when they could just get syndicated stuff from Alifant or whatnot uh, over the wire for like, I don't know, $20 a week maybe. Um, so, and, and also my, my, and I don't know if this is too much, but my feeling was I also had literary aspirations and I, and if I'm going to be, you know, sacrificing my life for, for art, it's not going to be for, I mean, the, the main one was, you know, writing more. And so, um, I, you can't support one artistic a aspiration with another when they're both, uh, financially, um, self-destructive. And so I just gave up the, the, the art part. And then years later, I, I ended up writing a travel guide to Central Eastern uh, European Jewish sites. And then, I don't know, early aughts, started getting into it again, did a comic, did a couple more comics, and I started feeling the, um, the itch again. So it sort of like fell back into it. So your style is very refined and very recognizable. Did it take you a while to develop the you know, Ellie Valley style? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if it's, you know, style is both um, what you aspire to and what you're limited by. And so you have some models that you're that you're excited by, like 1950s comics, underground comics, um, Yiddish cartoons of the early 20th century, but also, you know, limitations. I, I was never um, formally trained. I, I took some, you know, some classes here and there, but I never had, um, you know, a, a rigorous uh, artistic training. And so being self-taught, um, there, there are many negatives to that. Yeah, I'm too many negatives to it, but the couple positives are, you know, you, you sort of, um, you might be doing things, you're not in like a community of people who are sort of, um, uh, guiding each other and maybe emulating each other, or, you know, all inspired by the same thing or taught by the same, um, uh, talents. Um, and so I sort of developed, um, my style. I don't, I don't even think of it as a style, but just like the way I draw sort of came organically. From that. It seems that the best political cartoons, the hypercritical, contrarian, outsider, truth to power variety, harmonize with a specific Jewish sensibility. To me, your work is sort of a postmodern next phase iteration of the satire and grotesquerie found in the urban Jewish secular, proudly irreverent mad magazines of the mid 20th century. Is this a fair assessment? I mean, sure. I mean, I, um, <laughs> I don't conceal the, um, you know, inspiration um, and excitement I have um, for the mad comics. Initially, I mean, actually, when I was little, it was the magazines, but then I discovered the comics, the 1950s comics, um, 
Precode before it became a magazine. Um, when they were also EC Comics was also putting out these horror titles as well and science fiction titles. But the you know Harvey Kurtzman, Will Elder, uh, Kriegstein, uh, all these other um, artists in here in uh, New York City, immigrants or the children of immigrants, um, had this verb and cacophonous sort of um, uh, you know audio. It's not audio, but um, you know all, all the balloons coming together like I don't know like various um, pages of theirs, and obviously the um, frenetic free for all. Um, visual uh excitement circus quality uh appealed to me uh so yeah oh also i mean like walverton basil walverton would do these like really grotesque uh images and i, I would see that when i was little and it was it opened up some worlds yeah just wondering if you could share with us uh some of the tools and techniques that you use to create your cartoons uh well i used to use uh you know winsor newton um i think it was number zero or triple zero brush on bristol board um yeah it's been so long i mean uh like uh, essentially like 10 years ago i moved over because i was never confident uh that um drawing on a you know screen would perfectly emulate the the feel of brush uh against paper um but um one of, one of the problems one of the challenges of brush on paper with my work is uh white on black black on white waiting for the ink to dry uh it, it, it can be really maddening. So I moved to a computer, Wacom Cintiq. It's a screen and a stylus. There is um, fluctuations in the line based on pressure sensitivity. So you can emulate a brush, but uh, the difference is you don't wait for things to dry because you're on the computer, but also um, you can switch. I can switch back and forth uh, from black to white um, with inking. I use one button on the computer um, to go back and forth, black and white. I think I think everyone does this basically. Uh, others, other artists who do things, you know, on a on a Cintiq. Um, so it's just like a really rapid. You get into the zone of uh, rapid, like throwing down black, carving out white. So it has this sort of engraving feel to it, even though it's not an engraving. Um, it's something that I could never do with brush and ink because you had to when you had to wait for the white to dry, waiting for the black to dry, and then you know even going the white over the black, I would get this like Japanese uh, plaque uh, white stuff. Um, you know, and if you leave it out, then it's gone. But then you add some water, you can, it was like sort of, it was like a chemical process. Um, but th like the consistency was different and, um, it, it, there was a beauty to it, but it's also very, um, it can be very frustrating. So, um, doing it, you know, this way, it, it's still similar to the way I used to draw, um, in terms of the effects, but I can do some things that I couldn't do uh, previously. And the, and the, the way of doing them is different, you know? Um, when I was when I was first starting off uh, doing it on the computer, again, you can stop me if this is um, too much, but um, I, I would like look for these brushes uh, that had sort of texture to them, um, and uh, I feel like you know, for me, some of the early stuff I wanted like I love the dry brush feel of uh, brush against bristle board, and I was trying to emulate that, but um, ultimately I just settled on a single brush, just like I, I would use a single brush of Windsor Newton. Again, I don't remember the the number. I think it I think it was uh, probably triple O. Um, and so uh, I use one brush made by this this um, person who sells you know little brush packs for the computer. Um, Clip Studio Paint is the program, the app, and uh, just use that single brush, single um, size of the brush. Uh, so I don't have to like worry about all this different kind of you know effects of textured brushes. Just use one, and I think that that is. Um, sort of like limitations can um, also uh, open uh, pathways, you know? Your cartoons, which the right-leaning Jewish magazine commentary called Ferociously Repugnant, have attracted some angry responses from Jewish readers. I'm sure you've been labeled a self-hating Jew by some of them. I've occasionally received that sort of vitriol myself, to which I reply, I'm actually a self-loving Jew. I just have a problem with some other types of Jews. What's your response to those who are offended by your work, especially from the Jewish right? Have these criticisms evolved or perhaps worsened over the years? It's sort of like a complicated issue. Um, in, on, on the Jewish right, that, um, aided by, you know, mass uh, pedagogical um, propaganda uh, from birth through death in the Jewish community, 
um, uh, of, you know, Zionist bent, essentially, um, they're able to um, define all departures from Zionist ideology as self-hating. A lot of my um, work pokes fun at the whole idea that Zionism is our internal essence. Uh, and uh, if we stray from that, then, you know, if we stray from a 19th, 20th century uh, ethno-nationalist ideology, we don't love Judaism. It's so absurd. And yet that is the um, official line of the American Jewish community and Jewish communities throughout the world, actually. Um, so uh, for years, like when I was doing the forward comics, they would say, oh, you know, uh, he hates Jews because he's drawing Jewish comics influenced by Jews, uh, grappling with Jewish issues, but he doesn't love ethno-nationalism so much, you know? Uh, so that was their line. But then um, I think in the Trump era, things got a little bit uh, more uh, confused for them because uh, they, you know, the, the Trump aligned um, members of the Jewish community had um, embraced um, the hero of American Nazism. And that's where Zionism took them. And so it, it got a little um, uh, maybe intellectually fraught for them. And uh, so they're like, they're embracing Nazis, they're embracing white nationalists, they're embracing the people who incite synagogue shooters, and they're still trying to call me a Nazi. Um, it's absurd. They, they still do it, though, because, uh, yeah, you know, their brains haven't broken yet, and they're, they're still... They, 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 they're unable to pull themselves out, even when they are embracing the most pernicious forces in history. Um, but it is a little bit more um, absurd and transparent um, in the current era, as opposed to, you know, when I was drawing Obama uh, and Netanyahu. Enjoying the show? Click like and subscribe. Your illustrations are often jarring, from caricatures of Netanyahu and Trump to takedowns of neo-Nazis and the Republican Jewish coalition. Is there a unifying theme in your work? Maybe the ugliness of hypocrisy? There, there are multiple themes. Um, I guess you could say that um, idealism and disillusionment you know, can feed this kind of rage. But also, you know, I do treasure uh, Jewish tradition and not necessarily, you know, Jewish tradition in terms of like following the mitzvot, but the Jewish ethical tradition, as you, as you know, from, you know, secular humanistic Jew Judaism, um, and Jewish cultural tradition. And, um, it really, uh, it, it upsets me, uh, to see, um, the tradition shat all over and also discarded and replaced by this, um, you know, this golem that it's, that it's, uh, come out of the past century, uh, and and sort of like this revisionism of what um, of what Judaism is, which is not to say that you know my vision of Judaism is the only one, um, or that Judaism is not and Jewish culture and spirituality is not extremely you know uh, multifaceted, uh, but those on the right and those who are uh, predominantly the you know leaders and the the people who make the mission of the diaspora Jewish community. Um, are wedded to the idea that there is uh, one form of Judaism. Would you say that your artwork is motivated by rage? It is. It's rage that in, that inspires the the idea behind a lot of my best work. You know, like when uh, back you know just a few years ago when Trump is uh, and and to this day he says it, but back like within the immediate aftermath of synagogue shootings when he's saying that Democrats uh, are all anti Semites and you can't be a Jew and vote for a Democrat. You know, and just, you know, when when the when the graves are still fresh of the people that were murdered based on his incitement um, and the entire Republican Party's incitement, um, that is pure rage. And a lot of my um, most visceral work came out of that rage or also. And this is, you know, has to do with Zionism as well. But, you know, uh, demonizing uh, some of the Jewish community's greatest allies in terms of progressive um, activism demonizing them as anti-Semites because they believe that Palestinians are human beings. That kind of thing would inspire a lot of rage. And, 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 and you know, demonizing women of color in particular, you know, and it's like this, it's, it, to me, it's just, it's, uh, it's a Shanda that that is allowed anywhere inside the Jewish community. And yet it is basically pervasive uh, in communal leadership. 
sounds like this is one of the distinctions you were making between your approach and maybe that of a syndicated cartoonist where your work is motivated by inspiration as opposed to a deadline. So you're able to sort of work with this inner uh, anger and, and turn it into some great art uh, kind of on your own schedule. Well, that's interesting. Uh, we didn't actually get into that. I alluded to the syndication back in the day. I don't even know like how many, I don't know the way syndication works anymore in the entirely imploded uh, billionaire bought up, you know, and then decimated um, uh, media field today. But it is true that um, I would not be able to do the, the stuff I do if I was working on a, um, you know, three times a week or even weekly um, deadline. Um, because then you have to make a compromise be, um, between inspiration and output. And um, I, uh, I, I, I would burn out if I was doing that um, very quickly. And, um, and my stuff would, would be wrote by this point. So if, if, I, if I have an idea that doesn't really inspire me, almost always, with maybe a couple exceptions, I have to say, but uh, almost always I will discard it. Because, you know, it actually is, um, partly because I'm not formally trained, it is work. It is work to draw. As much as I enjoy it, it is work. And I'm not going to spend my time on something that I'm not excited by. One of your pieces that has stayed with me is your 2022 comic, An American Talisman, published in the progressive magazine Jewish Currents. The cartoon addresses the Tennessee school board's banning of Art Spiegelman's graphic novel Mouse. You show how Spiegelman was himself disgusted by the Steven Spielberg-produced animated cartoon An American Tale, which came out around the same time as Mouse was being anthologized and was, by design, a toned-down, universalized story involving essentially coded Jewish mice with a happy ending suitable for Christians who long for a redemption narrative. You also describe Spielberg's Schindler's List as one of these Christian-friendly redemption tales, one that resolves itself in the land of Israel. Are there implicit restrictions in terms of how Jews can tell Jewish stories to mainstream audiences? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I mean, the, the key question here is mainstream because, you know, Jews can and have told multiplicity of stories from a wide variety of um, experiences and perspectives. But mainstream, um, I mean, it, it is possible that... Um, uh, the 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 width of the spectrum that is sellable. I mean, that's what mainstream it is. Um, it's a bit more narrow when when it's um, when when you need to appeal to as broad a community as possible, uh, or, you know, readership or audience. Um, but uh, I mean, but Mouse was you know a a major phenomenon, and that did not pull any punches, and that was very. Um, specifically and uniquely Jewish um, and not anodyne. I mean, you know, I, I guess it's a little bit, um, it, it can be a little bit simplistic to compare a mouse and um, uh, Fievel American Tale because uh, American Tale is, you know, essentially for children, although it's um, sort of like this uh, uh, bedrock of American Jewish identity for many. Um, so, uh I don't think uh, Jews need to, you know, Christianize their experiences or their their output in order to reach mainstream audiences. No, I think maybe um, maybe in the past um, at a certain point that was the case. But I don't think it's I don't think it's been the case for for a while now. Um, I think with Spielberg, it wasn't necessarily um, his desire to um, appeal to a Gentile audience. Um, I think it was his own, uh, you know, artistic or aesthetic outlook that that drove that. And I think if the protagonist was more explicitly, you know, there was a Jewish protagonist instead of Oscar Schindler, um, it still would have had a, a huge impact because it's Steven Spielberg. Whatever he decided at that point in his career would have been enormous, right? Your book, Diaspora Boy, Comics on Crisis in America and Israel, exposes how Israel's centrism has hijacked American Jewish identity and silenced the secular, not particularly nationalistic Jewish majority. What, in your view, are the biggest contemporary challenges to Jewish identity in the U.S.? The Boy, I think, is still uh, completely relevant, but obviously um, 
after October 7th, everything that the Astro Boy talks about is like more extreme. It's like we're off the cliff now and like our legs are, you know, the Wally Coyote type stuff. The American Jewish community's connection to um, Israel at a time when Israel is committing crimes against humanity on a daily basis when um, there are, you know, mass protests or I don't know, mass, but protests in 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 favor of um, sexually abusing prisoners. Um, I mean, that's just happening, you know, in the recent past. It, there's stuff like over and over again, you know, revelations um, and and um, and that we institutionally in the American Jewish community, we're, we're still um, connected to this. We're still told to support this and uh, we're still um, abusing the term anti-Semitism uh, to silence dissent on this. Um, it's it's just become more and more extreme. And I think it's particularly troubling for younger people who don't have the nostalgic affinity, that sort of instinctual affinity for Israel as their parents or grandparents might have had. Absolutely. Um, but the people who are funding our organizations are of the generation of our parents and grandparents. And so when you have like uh, students in college who need uh, Jewish uh, institutional frameworks, uh, not just for like the basic stuff like Shabbat dinners, but also um, teaching, learning and engaging with each other. It's something like Hillel, which is fiercely Zionist and fiercely against uh, other uh, you know, other expressions of Jewish identity and um, Jewish um, uh, experience. What's the best way for our audience to follow and support your work? Well, I have a Patreon. That'd be nice if people want to um, support me because it's it's actually very um, um, essential to my uh, being able to breathe. And um, uh, uh, well, Twitter, Instagram uh, is my name. And also Patreon is, you know, my name, at, you know, forward slash Ellie Valley, that kind of thing. Um, so that's probably the best way. Thank you for joining us, Ellie. Thank you for having me. And to our audience, now back to your regularly scheduled lives. Amusing Jews is here to amuse you. If you like being amused, go ahead and click like and subscribe. <laughs>